1968, a neuroscientist came across it while he was doing a project, and he said, well, this would be a good way for me to study the anatomy of the different uh, nerve pathways that go from the eye through the brain. I'll just use this monosodium glutamate to kill the eye cells, and then I can trace it back through the brain. Well, he did that, and what he found out to his surprise was that it not only destroyed the eye cell, but it was destroying critical parts of the brain as well. And that uh, the parts of the brain that was being destroyed resemble some uh, destruction we see in things like strokes, uh, things we see with severe hypoglycemia or very low blood sugars, and like uh, we see in diseases like Alzheimer's disease. And so he immediately realized this is something that's quite serious because this is a food ingredient. And he thought, he told me this story. He said, naively, I thought all I had to do is present the information to food manufacturers and they would take it out. <laughs> and he said, to my surprise, they just totally ignored it. They said, we don't care. It doesn't make any difference. By then, it was a multi-billion dollar business. Um, and it solved their food taste problems. So he went to his congressman, and congressman called a congressional hearing, and he presented it before a congressional hearing. Overwhelming. He was a neuropathologist as well as a neuroscientist. He presented his evidence, showed these severe lesions produced in the brain by monosodium glutamate. The food industry was present at the hearing, and particularly those who make baby foods. And... Uh, they saw the handwriting on the wall. If this reaches the public, we're in deep trouble. So they said, well, we voluntarily will remove monosodium glutamate from baby food because that's a very sensitive time when the brain is formed. So they voluntarily uh, withdrew MSG. Well, not really. For 10 more years, they continued to add it, but in a disguised name. And the amount they were adding to the baby food was the amount that was being used to destroy these brain cells in these animals. Even today, they add excitotoxins to baby foods, and they created another class of food called toddler foods to, side, to sidestep this restriction they put on themselves. And in toddler foods, if you look at it, you'll see several of these excitotoxins have been added. And it's also added to baby formulas. Now, let's look at uh, what I call the, the big lies of the industry. When all of this starts leaking out, and it was starting to leak out about the dangers of MSG, the industry's reaction was, well, we had our scientists look at it, and uh, we don't see any problem. Their first solution was, well, the doses you used in those experiments were very high doses, and that's not what you're going to see babies eating and children and women. That, that's, you know, that's not a reason. We're using a little tiny doses. That was lie number one. Lie number two was, they said, well, even if it does enter the bloodstream and in very high concentrations, the brain has a protective system called the blood-brain barrier that keeps certain toxins from your blood from entering your brain. And it would keep that glutamate out of your brain and wouldn't damage it. And when that didn't work, they went to the third lie. They had a research paper that said, well, we, we have studied it and found out that if you eat a lot of carbohydrates and sugar, it inhibits this toxicity and doesn't occur, so that protects you. And most people eat meals that have carbohydrates in it, so there's, it's really no problem. Well, let's look at lie number one. Lie number one saying that this, these little small quantities but what we'll see later on is that humans are more sensitive to the toxicity of MSG than any experimental animal. We're five times more sensitive than the next most sensitive life form, the mouse. Five times more sensitive. We're 20 times more sensitive than a rhesus monkey. Um, this is a study that was done by the FASF organization. That's the Federation of American Societies of Experimental Biology. They did an ex uh, a review of all the things that had been written about MSG. And they were going to have a, a final conclusion about the safety of MSG. 
The study was conducted and paid for by the FDA, and it had an executive summary in the, in the front part of it that if you read it, you would think they never saw the actual paper itself. So there's no relationship between their executive summary by the FDA and what the paper actually said. The paper reads almost like my book. Um, but that's what the media read. In, this, in the bulk of the paper, this was their conclusion about infant formula, was that the amount of monosodium glutamate compound, which they call uh, casein hydrosylates, is a new trick name they use, regularly, these babies are regularly consuming large quantities of glutamate. In your, in your children. Now let's look at line number two. It doesn't penetrate the brain because the brain is protected by this blood-brain barrier. Well, we know that in the human brain, even in an adult, there are certain areas of the brain in which there's no blood-brain barrier. For instance, if we look at the pituitary gland, the posterior pituitary gland, and uh, lining inside, I'm a beam stuff. Uh, always carry a spare. There are certain critical areas of the brain that have no barrier. So anything that's in your blood is going to go into your brain in those areas. These are very critical zones of the brain. So that shows that that part's a lie. And we know that uh, even if you have a normal intact part of your brain with a normal blood-brain barrier, if you have a high level of glutamate in your blood over time, it'll penetrate even the normal blood-brain barrier. And third, we know that there are frequent causes in which the blood-brain barrier is disrupted. These aren't rare conditions, strokes. That's not rare. Think how many tens of millions of people in the United States are walking around who have had a stroke. Many don't even know they've had a stroke. We call them mini strokes. They occur in silent areas of the brain. It opens up the blood-brain barrier. Whatever's in your food is going to go through there. Head injury. Millions of people have had head injuries. Hypertension. How many people in this country has high blood pressure? It'll open the blood-brain barrier. Diabetes. A common condition. If you've ever had brain surgery, if you've ever had a heat stroke, when you have a high fever, it opens your blood-brain barrier. Certain drugs uh, that people take uh, for different conditions will open the blood-brain barrier. Multiple sclerosis is a common disease in which the blood-brain barrier is open. That's what happens. Every time they have this onset of symptoms, the blood-brain barrier is opening up, and that's why they have the symptoms. So if they're consuming food with a lot of MSG in it or NutraSweet or other excitotoxins, it goes through these openings in the MS plaques in the brain, and they get a lot worse. And what we find in MS patients is if they consume a food with MSG, they will get worse for days or weeks afterwards. It's a prolonged worsening. Every time they consume it, they get worse again. They go to their doctor. Their doctor says, oh, that's just the natural course of the disease. It's not the natural course of the disease in these instances. They're poisoning themselves. Severe hypoglycemia. If you have low blood sugar, it'll open up your blood-brain barrier. So if, you have a, if you're a diabetic, and hypoglycemia is common in diabetics who are using the insulin, their blood sugar will fall real low. That opens the blood-brain barrier. If they're doing what most doctors in this country tell them to do and use NutraSweet, when they open their blood-brain barrier during one of these spells, it's being flooded by toxins. If you've had a radiation, in other words, if you had x-ray treatments to your head, it opens up your blood-brain barrier. And if you have infections in that area, it'll open up the blood-brain barrier. So we see uh, that these big lies, so far we've wiped out number one and number two. Now let's look at number three, that carbohydrates and other food products will block excitotoxicity. Um, what they have found with this is that there was an experiment done by a person who does a lot of defending of MSG, saying it's safe. And he did an experiment on animals in which he fed them carbohydrates and his conclusion in the paper was the carbohydrates blocked the toxicity. Well, I got his paper and I read it, and that's not what the paper 
said at all. What the paper found was that if you take high concentrations of sugar or of, uh, refined carbohydrates, you will reduce the toxicity, but it still causes brain damage. Now, I was interested just how much carbohydrate or sugar does it take to give any protection? Well, according to his paper, it would take about 10 to 15 packs of sugar, these little packets of sugar. You'd have to eat that every time you ate a meal to get any protection. And in his own paper, anything less than that offered no protection. Or you'd have to eat 17 soda crackers every time you ate a meal that had MSG in it to get any protection. So that argument kind of fell to the wayside. So we see that three big lies have just gone by the wayside, but they never give up. They come up with another one. Now these are the, di the uh, uh, disguised names of MSG. Once they found out we were hot on the trail, they said, well, our only alternative is to change the names so the public doesn't recognize it. And this is just a partial list of the names that they have come up with. A uh, frequent one is hydrolyzed vegetable protein. You see that in many, many foods, a lot of soups. You see it sold at health food stores. Uh, when you hydrolyze a protein, what you do is you break it down and you release its amino acids. One of the higher concentrated amino acids is glutamate. Another one is aspartate, which is also an excitotoxin. L-cysteine is an excitotoxin. Glycine magnifies excitotoxicity. And these amino acids are released and highly concentrated in these different protein products. So if you get textured protein, vegetable uh, protein, hydrolyzed plant protein, there are all kinds of disguised names. Whey protein, enzymes, uh, spices, natural flavoring is a common name they use. Uh, carrageenan is one of the newer ones. It's a uh, highly inflammatory product. They use that experimentally if you want to produce intense inflammation. You can inject that in an animal, and they'll have an intense inflammatory reaction. Good thing to put in foods. Broth, stock, just, the names just go on and on and on. So you have to know the names to be able to recognize it. And you'll see foods that'll say, contains no MSG, but they'll contain three or four of these. And the law allows them to do it because the FDA law says that only if it's 99% pure MSG do they have to put it on the label. So it can be 98% MSG, and they don't even have to put it on the label. They can use one of these little names. And so you're not protected when you see it contains no MSG, or you go to the restaurant and you say, did your food contain MSG? And they say, no, but it contains hydrolyzed vegetable protein or some of these others. Uh, and sometimes they don't even know. You'd be amazed how I many people in restaurants have no idea that hydrolyzed vegetable protein is, is monosodium glutamate concentrate. Now these are the foods that are especially high in the excitotoxins. Anytime you use something like a gravy, uh, if you use salad dressings that are commercially prepared, particularly diet salad dressings, they're all high in glutamates. And you'd be amazed, and you know, people say they go out and eat, and they have a salad, and they use the ranch dressing, and they have this horrible headache. Or they clouded in their thinking, they can't remember. That's because of the monosodium glutamate in the salad dressing. Soups are notorious. All commercial soups use a lot of monosodium glutamate, and Campbell's soup is the worst. Uh, Campbell's, I check their labels regularly. I've seen as many as four different types of excitotoxins added to a single can of soup. And that's why they taste so good. And what happens when you're sick? Let's have some soup. What do they do in the hospital when you come back from brain surgery or you come back from other kind of surgery or you've had hypertension or diabetes problem? Well, we're going to put you on a, low, a, a diet right now of just soup all the time. This is the stepwise after surgery. You start with soup and then 